All right. Welcome back, everybody, to the Dharma Doors. I'm MC Owens, and this is the San Francisco Dharma Collective. Um, and the theme for tonight's talk, the theme for tonight's uh, Dharma Doors, is going to be Buddha lands. Um, technically, what we're going to be talking about is an idea called a Buddha, <clears throat> pardon me, a Buddha Kshetra a Buddha field, otherwise known as a Buddha land. So this is, a, I've talked about this a few different times so far, this, uh, this, you know, the last few Dharma doors, because we've been working on a particular sutra that would be called a pure land sutra. And we talked about kind of purifying Buddha lands. That's very much what this sutra is about. But because of what I'm going to read tonight, I'm going to continue a little bit of reading that I started last week. And because of what I'm going to read, I want to give a really, really nice kind of summary explanation of some ideas that are involved in this idea of a Buddha land or a Buddha field, also called a pure land. Um, so I want to talk about that a little bit and get us acquainted with that idea. I think it's such a really interesting, beautiful Buddhist idea, the idea of a Buddha land or a Buddha field. Um, but let's kind of start with some basics. So you may have heard of something called pure land Buddhism as a movement, as a sect, maybe. I don't know. I don't know how you've heard about it. But the idea is, is that there is a trend. There is a style of Buddhist practice that could be called pure land Buddhist practice. And it's a very old Buddhist practice, by the way. Very, very old. And I mean, the sutra that we're reading is a very old sutra that's talking about these Buddha lands. But of course, in the modern world and for quite some time, Pure Land Buddhist practice has been of a particular flavor. And what I mean by that is, is that if you're familiar with Pure Land Buddhism, you might think of it as this kind of idea of there being these other Buddha lands, these other places. In some traditions, they appear to be kind of like heavenly abodes. In other traditions, they are other worlds. I've even seen some modern Buddhist traditions where there are other planets. <laughs> like literally, they're pointing to constellations and saying, oh yeah, the so-and-so Buddha's pure land is over there. So that is the kind of Buddhism that we're talking about tonight. But what I'm going to talk about is sort of the origins of this practice and sort of uh, I'm going to try to make it make sense so that the reading makes sense. So what I want to kind of do is I want to back up and sort of just define where this idea of a Buddha Kshetra comes from. And let's start with that word Kshetra, K sh or s but it's a sh k sh e t r a a kshetra that word means mm, it's usually translated as a field but they really literally mean like a uh like a soccer field like uh, uh um well not a soccer field but a field like a, the land the area in that way so that's what a kshetra is, and it doesn't really have too much special significance besides just being a kind of a, a field. And I want to make it kind of clear that the general language is, again, it's about a location in that sense. Mm, there's an, a Buddhist idea about a Buddha kshetra, though. And I just want to share this with you because this is where the idea seems to come from. 
One of the earliest Buddhist uses of the idea of a Buddha Kshetra was the idea of the sphere of influence of a Buddha, of an awakened being. And the idea is, is in the, in the early Buddhist tradition, in the kind of Theravada or the Hinayana, as it might be called, a Buddha, a fully enlightened being, is, is said to have an actual field or sphere of influence. And if you, if anybody were to get into that zone and they, they give the sphere of influence in the number of feet or the, 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 the equivalent, but the idea is it's a spatial zone where if you step into that zone of sphere of influence of a Buddha, it would have an effect on you. And in some cases, you could kind of even have your, you know, Dharma eye be cleansed, or you could have your wisdom eye open up just by entering a Buddha's field of influence. So that seems to be the older, original use of this term of a Buddha Kshetra. And of course, in general, they were talking about Gotama, Siddhartha, Shakyamuni, the historical Buddha, and, you know, sort of the effect that the Buddha had on people within a certain vicinity. That seems to be the way that it was used in the early tradition. But of course, we're reading a sutra that's from the Mahayana Buddhist tradition. And in the Mahayana Buddhist tradition, a Buddha Kshetra takes on a very, very different meaning. And... Yeah, I, so we're going to talk about that meaning of it. And the basic idea of the Mahayana Buddhist idea, well, this is complicated. <laughs> so I'm going to tell you a few things. I'm going to approach this rather intellectually tonight. Um, so yeah, and I'll, actually, I'll, I'll do it a little more simply because I don't want this to get too intellectual in that sense. But let me read, I'm going to just start with a reading, not from the sutra, it's going to be from a different sutra. I found this reading, it's a reading I really enjoy. So what I'm going to be reading from for a moment, it's real short, by the way, it's just a sentence, really. It's from a sutra called the Sharangama Sutra, one of, one of my favorites. And a Mahayana Buddha Sutra, for sure. And I'm just going to read you this one little line that I'm going to play with a little bit uh, for the next little bit and sort of break this down. But the sutra reads something like this. All living beings from the time without beginning have disregarded their true selves by clinging to external objects, thereby missing the fundamental mind. Thus, they are being turned around by objects and perceive large and small sizes. If they can rather turn objects around, they will be like the Buddha, and their bodies and minds will be in the state of radiant perfection from their immutable sight of enlightenment the end of each of their hairs will contain all lands throughout 10 directions <laughs> all right so that's a really great description of a Buddha land. In fact, it even references it, this idea of from their immutable sight of enlightenment, the end of each of their hairs will contain all the lands throughout the 10 directions. But let's, I'm gonna play with a little bit of a few of the ideas in there. So all living beings, all sentient beings, from the time without beginning, so just think about that one for a minute. The time without beginning have disregarded their true selves by clinging to external objects. 
thereby missing the fundamental mind. Thus they are being turned around by objects, perceiving large and small sizes. If they can turn objects around, they'll be like the Buddha. So let's play or work with that a little bit more. So this is a really important idea for all kinds of Buddhism, not just Pure Land Buddhism, not just Mahayana Buddhism, but a really, really important idea is, of course, clinging to external objects. And of course, the basics of Buddhism are about desire, clinging, attachment, leading to suffering. And of course, there are a variety of Buddhist text techniques to not do that, to not cling at and grasp at and need external objects. Now, what we've done a lot of talking about lately, because of the nature of the, the main sutra we're reading, we've done a lot of talking about early Buddhism versus Mahayana Buddhism. And as I mentioned last week, Early Buddhism, what would be called Hinayana or Theravada, it's very, very focused on sort of the, this, the, the desire and like the wanting and the craving or the aversion. And so there are, again, meditative techniques of calming or shamatha to bring that under control and so that the habit, the bad habit, of grasping and clinging or being averse, that those habits will sort of fade away, eventually fade completely away. The Mahayana, however, is definitely still interested in not clinging, not being attached, not craving, not suffering. But the focus is a little bit more on what could be called wisdom, insight. And the idea being that if one is wise, if one is insightful, there wouldn't be a lot of room for clinging and grasping in that sense. It wouldn't need to be worked out because there wouldn't be the desire for it if there was certain wisdom. So that's where we're going to start tonight. And I want to focus on that really beautiful line about how Sentient beings are being churned around and being turned around by objects rather than being like a Buddha and turning objects around. So let's start with, I'm going to start with a few examples to work us through that idea. And it, I'm going to start with this one. This is like a classic one that I use a lot all the time, which is this idea of... <laughs> Well, that. Now, the example that I want to work with is I want to kind of create a scenario, as I often do, in which there are two different people. And one person sees this and gets this warm, fuzzy, nostalgic feeling. Another person <laughs> sees that and gets this kind of uh, anxious uh, uncomfortableness, I, I call it aversion. And what we realize, or what I'll tell you, is that the first person, when they were a child, went to a petting zoo and was given a little bunny rabbit. And when they held the little bunny rabbit, it was like the best day of their life. The weather was perfect. The bunny was so cute. It was just like the best day. And so bunny rabbits have this kind of warm, fuzzy association, if you will. The other person, however, when they were a child, went to a petting zoo, but was given this kind of mean duck that bit the child. And therefore, the child had a terrible day wound up crying, it was the weather was terrible. And ever since then, that person has a kind of aversion to fowl, aversion to ducks in that way. 
Now, what I want you to notice is, is that if I, and don't think of, please don't think of this as a piece of paper, optical illusion, like really think of it as a creature. And one person sees the creature and they see a bunny rabbit and they get that warm, fuzzy feeling. The other person sees a duck and gets that anxious, averse feeling. The idea, of course, is that both of those people are being turned around by an object. And by turned around, we're talking about emotionally being turned around, right? Being all excited or being all disappointed or whatever it is. But the idea is some external object, as the sutra says, some other thing has messed with us, has like messed with our minds and gotten us all worked up. Now, of course, the idea here is, is that this is arguably neither a duck nor a rabbit, but what's going on is one mind's state of conditioning is such that when they see a certain form, it conjures in their mind the idea of a rabbit, and of course, rabbits give the warm, fuzzy feeling. Now, perceptively, in terms of perception, a Buddhist would actually notice that it could be working this way. When I showed, when I showed the object, the first person got a warm, fuzzy feeling and therefore saw a rabbit. The other person got uncomfortable and therefore saw a duck. So what I'm getting at is, is that there's a kind of little feedback loop there where we think we thought we saw what we saw and it gives us the feeling, but it could be that the feeling was there first making us think that we thought we saw that. And there's no priority in Buddhism, in this idea of dependent origination, which I'm basically talking about, these are arising simultaneously. So the appearance or the perception of a duck or a rabbit and the emotionality are ar arising simultaneously. But what I want to focus on is how both people are being turned around by the object in that sense, being emotionally churned. Now, what would it mean to be a buddha? Well, first of all, it would be to be very, very aware of how perception is functioning at all. Being very aware that it is the mind of the perceiver that is conjuring these images. And what I mean is, if these two people started to get into an argument and one person was like, no, it's a rabbit. And the other person is like, no, it's not. It's a duck. Those two people could start arguing. And the idea is, is that the reality or, I mean, the conventional reality that we live in is one in which somebody has to be right and somebody has to be wrong. That's the normal mode that we think in. And, and if, you're, if you're wondering or if you're questioning what I'm saying, remember, I'm not talking about an optical illusion. I'm talking about two people walking through a field, seeing a creature run across, and one person saying, oh, it was a rabbit. And the other person saying, no, it wasn't, it was a duck. And in the world, in the conventional reality that we tend to live in, one of those people is right and one of them is wrong, or they could both be wrong, but only because it was actually a prairie dog. But the idea that it was actually, really, truly something, 
That's what we want to be questioning right now. The very idea of what could be called <laughs> objective reality. The idea that there's actually something out there that is either a prairie dog, a duck, or a rabbit, or you know, maybe we've never seen it before, but it's got to be something. But from a Buddhist point of view, it doesn't need to be something. It can actually only be perceptions in a conditioned mind. And insofar as things are <laughs> perceptions in a conditioned mind, they have no objective reality, they have a subjective reality. Do they follow me on that? I, yo. So, I mean, you're saying like getting hung up, hung up on that there has to be a distinction between like what is true and untrue, the, the, the desire for that, or just the full notion of it at all. Oh yeah, no, deeper. So, you know, really, really, Brendan, really walk through the scenario. Me and you, we're walking through a field, we see something. In, in, in a real, like a real day of me and you walking there, we would both be convinced that it was actually objectively something. And even though you're like, oh, it was a duck. And I'm like, no, it was a rabbit. We would say to each other, well, let's go look closer and determine who's right. And we could get there and then I would be like, look, it's a rabbit. And we might come to a decision that it is a rabbit. And the idea is, is that in conventional reality, we stop at that final determination that it is X, Y, or Z, that it is this or that. And we determine who's right and who's wrong. At this more subtle level, we're getting to the idea that nobody is right or wrong, but if somebody is insisting that their perception is right, that would be wrong. <laughs> Follow me out? Yeah. Okay. So I have another example really quickly. So it's the same idea. But now I'm going to, I want to use like kind of a more concrete example and not an optical illusion. So the idea is, what color is that? Now, the idea is, is you might say it's yellow, right? But we know, you know, us modern, very scientific people, we know that the color yellow is emerging dependent upon the makeup, the, the actual biological anatomic makeup of the eye. And that depending upon the way that the rods and cones of the eye are organized, the color yellow appears to a certain beholder. But if somebody had different sets of rods and cones, this could appear like that. It could appear a different color. And the same question could be asked, well, what color is it? Like, like, what color is it really? And the idea here is, is, oh, it isn't any color really. It will appear differently to different people. Now, what I'm pointing at is, the idea of objective reality, the idea that it, that it's this idea that there is a God's eye view of reality that can determine what color it really is. And that way we will know if that person is correct or not. But the idea is, is there is no God's eye view of reality. So I ask you again, what color is it? All you can tell me is what color it appears to you in that sense. But to make any definitive statement about what color it is absolutely objectively is delusional in that sense. And it's not, I mean, not delusional. I mean, it is from a Buddhist point of view. But again, if you just think scientifically about the way eyes and visual phenomena work, 
you know that it isn't any color in that way. All right, everybody follow me on that. Okay, so now, yeah, Tanya. I was just gonna say there's red green color blindness. So that's like a. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. And of course, we're not just talking about color blindness in that way. I'm just using it as a very concrete example of how it could be that phenomena out there maybe don't have the characteristics that we think they do. So let me do it even a different one. So the, the text that I read, it mentioned that those beings that are being uh, um, turned around by objects, it mentions that they perceive large and small sizes. Hmm. So the idea that I want to talk about next is the idea of something like that. But in particular, what I want to ask you about this one isn't about the color. It's about the size of it. Is that a big cup or a little cup? It's a little cup, right? <laughs> because the idea, of course, is that that's, that's a big cup, right? That's the big cup, right? Is, that's the big cup, right? This is the big one? <laughs> Wait a minute. I thought this was the big one, right? So the idea here is, is that size is one of the weirdest things to think about in terms of what we're talking about because the idea could be even regarding me and i do this one a lot which is i often ask am i a big guy it's a simple question am i a big guy right and the idea is is that if i went into a uh you know a certain room and everybody's head was there, and I was up here, you'd say, you are a big guy. You're a tall, big guy. Wow, I didn't, I didn't realize that you were so tall. I didn't realize you were so big. But then I go into the next room that's full of NBA basketball players, and I'm down here, and they're way up there. What happened to my tallness? I'm gonna go back in the other room because I like being tall. Now, the idea of course is that I am not big or small. It is relative in that sense. But once again, this is where perception can be confused. You could be under the impression that I'm tall that like it's a quality that is possessed by Michael, that it's like, but the point is, is that if it were really a quality that I possessed, it couldn't be taken away from me when I go in the next room, I would have to still be tall. But the idea is, is that when, depending on what I'm next to, I'm big or small. But once again, only in the conditioned mind of the perceiver, am I tall or not? And now, of, of course, everything that we're talking about gets even more subtle when we recognize that the mind is having its own relationship to the body in that way. And, e and me, Michael, could be confused into thinking that I'm tall meaning I could be the misperceiver here of my own height in thinking that I'm a very tall person. Now, if you're following me on that idea that, I'm, that I inherently am not big or small, I'll ask you again, is that a big cup? And at this point, you should be saying it is not big or small. It is definitely not tan and brown. 
And we could now really approach even this idea of a cup. Not the big or small one, not the brown and the, but the very idea that it's a cup. And of course, what I, I, I often like to do this one, which is which hand has a cup in it? They both do. But you didn't see that before, right? You didn't know that you had cups for hands, right? Now, what I just did was turned an object around. Rather than being turned around by objects, I just turned these objects around and I turned them into cups, just like that. <laughs> so that's a little like preview here <laughs> of what we're talking about regarding well, this kind of, what could you even call this? Um, in Western philosophy, what we are kind of talking about it is could be called phenomenalism or just phenomenology, because we're talking about this sort of emergence of phenomena in the mind of a beholder. But part of the illusion of phenomena is that it's out there, like, you know, out there versus being a phenomena that's arisen in the mind, that is the mind. It's not in the mind as if the mind is a container. It is of mind in that sense. So Western philosophy in the late 1800s, early 1900s reaches this point of understanding phenomenalism. That trend in Western philosophy in the post-war era, like in the, in the 40s and 50s, becomes sort of known at, or is extended to a, a practice, or I don't know if you call it a practice, but a philosophical tradition called existentialism. And existentialism is probably the closest to pure land Buddhism that you'll get in the West, surprisingly. And the reason why I say that is, is because what happens in philosophy, Western philosophy, is beginning with Plato and then to Aristotle, there's the idea that there's a world out there, like a world of objects and things and stuff and, all, you know, stuff. And the observer is simply a, um, an observer of an external world, S simply an observer of a world that's going on out there. And so if we want to get to the bottom, let's say, of what this is, then we should start tearing this apart and analyzing it at, at a molecular level. And we should, oh, you wanna know about the color? Well, then we better start analyzing light and reflection and refraction. and. But the point is, is that Western philosophy in the early days, it was fascinated by everything that was out there and just thought of this as, as if it were just seeing a, a film, that it was just viewing reality. Again, what happens in the uh, late 1800s is they basically, Western philosophers come to this realization of, oh, wow, this, meaning these eyes and these ears and the nose and the tongue and the body and this conditioned brain are fabricating reality. Now, in Western philosophy, they still believe, in a sense, that there is a world out there that is causing this phenomenal reality that I, uh, that I see before me. So Western philosophy, they still think that there's something out there causing this phenomenalism, but this world that I see in front of me is uniquely my own. It is a unique version based upon the conditionings of these eyes, 
these ears, this body, this mind. So at that level of Western philosophy and Western philosophical thinking, we are each in our own subjective little world. And the way that when I was in college and I was studying all of this, the image that came to my mind was like that we all have these like fish bowls on. <laughs> and everywhere we look, we think we're seeing the world, but we're really just seeing kind of our own mental state in that way. And you've got a fishbowl on and I've got a fishbowl on and we're kind of wandering around together thinking that we're interacting in the same world when we're not there may be a certain connective tissue of language it's what most kind of uh modern western philosophers would think that language is a kind of connective tissue between all of this the sort of the um tangent points of our of our fishbowl minds, the tangent points are language. So I say a word and that gets through your fishbowl and imp imprints your world with that idea, like a cup or something like that, right? But again, I'm still talking about Western philosophy where they still believe in an, kind of an external reality. That tradition of phenomenology or phenomenalism that I'm describing it eventually kind of gives birth to this existential tradition that I just mentioned. And the important thing about existentialism is it takes the sentient observer as the starting point of philosophy, of the starting point of inquiry. And then we can talk about trying to come to an understanding of an external world but the starting point is the existential state of the individual. That's where it all starts. And for me, that has a lot of relationship to this idea of pure land Buddhism, where one's own subjective world is the starting point in that sense. All right, everybody follow me on everything I'm talking about? Awesome, very cool. So now I have an, a little uh, anecdote, uh, a personal anecdote that I wanna share with you to kind of move us a little further along. I've told a few of you, I've mentioned this story probably a long time ago. It's one of my anecdotes. Um, so this is an experience that I had many years ago, probably going on 10, 11 years ago or so, but it left a very deep impression on me that pertains to everything that we're talking about tonight. So I happened actually to be living in a Buddhist monastery at the time. I was translating some sutras. So needless to say, I was in a very contemplative state of mind. Let's put it that way, where, um, you know, where practice and life had become very integrated in that way. So again, I just wanna give you a little background for the state of mind that I was in when this happened. And what happened was I was walking down the street, this was in San Diego, and I was walking down the street and down the sidewalk and I saw a woman walking towards me and she was walking a dog. She was walking what looked like a, a pit bull, one of those kind of stocky pit bull dogs. And the funniest thing happened, which is that I, I saw them and, you know, the way you do on the sidewalk, when people are coming towards you, you kind of, you figure out which way you're going to step. And so I had seen them. And then, and then when I looked up again, it was the same woman but she was with what appeared to be her husband. And he was a short, stocky guy who was walking next to her very protectively. And she was sort of, she kind of had her hand on like the back of his neck. So I don't know what, 
I read or what I saw, but I know what I saw, which is that one moment it was a woman and a dog. And the next minute it was a woman and her husband. And it was in that moment that I had a really, like I was very aware of what happened, which was, it was a, everything that I just got done talking about regarding perception. But what I realized was, and it, again, this was like a big, like, whoa, that these states of being that the Buddhists talk about, the animal realm or the human realm or the godly realm, that moment, that experience made me kind of think about how maybe it's not that all of you are human, but you appear human to me. You are acting like it, you talk like it, you all of these things. And so what I'm getting at is, is that experience planted in my conditioned mind, the possibility that what would be called rebirths, this idea of karma and reincarnation, that it's not an objective state of being that's out there. It's um, possibly, possibly a matter of perception in the mind of the individual. Now, after that event, when, and it was one of those things where it was just really clear to me that I had interpreted that person and then not, not unlike this, rather than seeing the human, I saw the, the dog animal version of this person. And the question or this idea that, well, no, they're really a person, but I was just a tripping or whatever and saw them as a dog, the idea is, is no, maybe I, the samskara, maybe the conditioning is that the dominant way of me seeing is of a human, but it doesn't need to be that way in terms of an objective reality. Wait, follow me on that. So let me tell you, or I want to share with you where that experience led me into thinking. The main thing that that did for me was it really opened me up to a deeper understanding of what the Buddhists mean when they talk about all sentient beings. And, you know, Mahayana Buddhism in particular, very, very focused on the salvation or the enlightenment, if you will, of all sentient beings. And the thing that I realized from that experience, and, you know, that's one of those, you know, precious experiences that you, you know, that affected me, I can tell you about it, but, you know, it's one of those things I feel like you just have to have a, a a similar experience to really know what I'm talking about in that way. But what that left me with was this kind of understanding that if I were to see, oh, I don't know, a little bug, it made me realize that it could be an incredibly dismissive mindset I have that says, just because that's a little tiny bug. Remember what we talked about in terms of big and small? Is it really a tiny little bug? Or is it tiny because I don't care about it? Is its size a reflection of my dismissiveness in that sense? And I would add to that, isn't that what allows me to possibly kill them so much easier because they're small? But if I just told what I told you about size is true, that things aren't actually big or small, then why do we celebrate an elephant but ignore a gnat? Right? So all of a sudden, again, for me, the Buddhist sensibility of all sentient beings makes a lot more sense to me because it actually might be a problem of my mind to only 
be concerned about humans or, you know, maybe some animals, but, you know, only those animals I don't eat. Right. So my point is, is that in an, in an early form of Buddhism and the basic form of Buddhism, reincarnation is a very real thing in that sense. And if you're a human now, you really are a human. But I mentioned last week, because last week's uh, session, by the way, if you didn't catch it, we talked about the different paths of rebirth. And we talked about the idea of being reborn as an animal, being reborn as a god. And even in last week's session, I mentioned that from a Mahayana Buddhist point of view, those rebirths are understood to be states of mind, not exactly, you know, uh, rebirths in that sense. And what I mean is, and I, I mentioned this last week, even in the general kind of Mahayana form of Buddhism, in those moments where we humans kind of start to just, you know, not think so much and just start to eat and maybe just like stare mindlessly eating, we might have been reborn as an animal in that moment where we're not fully using our humanity in that sense, by which, you know, I'm talking about our cognition. So in the Mahayana tradition, these rebirths are already fluid. These rebirths are all already just states of mind. And it's just that you were a human a moment ago, <laughs> that you tend to be a human now. But that karma train, as we talked about last week, it could make a slight turn in that way. Now, what I added to that conversation now, just now, was the possibility that not only are rebirth states of mind, but the perception of different creatures in different states of rebirth, that may very well be just a conditioned perception of the mind as well. So what all of this is getting to, by the way, is again, you can, and we do basically, tend to think about there being an objective reality. That there's this one objective reality that we are all looking at. And maybe you have an opinion about it and I have an opinion about it, but the idea is that there's this one reality. Versus this kind of mm, existentialism, where reality, if you will, radiates out from you, from the, from the seat of consciousness is where I would rather say it, not from you, but from the seat of consciousness. Reality radiates out from there. And the point is, or yeah, my, the point is, that's our experience. Again, we never get that God's eye view of reality. We are always coming at it from this point of view in that sense. So now, basically, what I can tell you is, is that objective reality in that sense, from a Buddhist point of view, is a delusion. The sense that there's one objective reality, that's a delusion. And then if you're like, oh, wow, okay. Oh, wow. Oh. And if you're understanding that you're sort of in the middle of your own little world, welcome to your pure land. <laughs> that is the idea of now you could get busy purifying your Buddha land in that sense. But the first step to purifying a Buddha land is recognizing that it's radiating out from the seat of consciousness in that sense. Okay. Yeah, I think that'll be good. Let's, I'll take it from there. So now we're gonna dive back into the, uh, the original suture that we're doing, which is this, uh, Manjushri's Pure Land Sutra. And we have been going through this Sunday nights for a while. And at this point in the sutra, the Buddha, 
is telling Shariputra all of these different qualities that a bodhisattva, if they have these qualities, they can purify their Buddha land in that sense. And at first the Buddha told us just one quality that a bodhisattva needs to purify their Buddha land. And then he told us about two and then three, four, five. And we finally reached the end of the list where it's the 10 qualities that if a bodhisattva has those, they can purify their Buddha land. And last week I read the first five. And the first five were that they are compassionate. The bodhisattva is compassionate and unafraid when hearing about the suffering endured by beings in hell. The bodhisattva, number two, the bodhisattva is compassionate and unafraid when hearing about the suffering endured by animals. The bodhisattva is compassionate and unafraid when hearing about the suffering endured by hungry ghosts. The bodhisattva is compassionate and unafraid when hearing about the decline and decay of the gods. And number five, the bodhisattva is compassionate and unafraid when hearing about the harms of poverty, famine, thievery, carelessness, and warfare among humans. So those were the first five. And those dealt with the five different paths of rebirth. It dealt with the bodhisattva hearing about the woes of those in those various states of rebirth. And the basic idea of last week's Dharma talk was that the early Buddhist tradition, again, the Hinayana, Theravada, you didn't want to go anywhere near a hell realm. That was terrible. You didn't want to go anywhere near the hungry ghost realm. You didn't want to be anywhere near the animal realm. And basically, if we were good Buddhists, we didn't want to have to deal with samsara, the cycle of birth, death, and rebirth, at all. And so it was about nirvana, the escape from samsara. That was the Hinayana program. That was the early program. Life sucks. Let's get out of there. The Bodhisattva path is a little different. And there's a lot I could go off on right now. I'm going to try to stay focused. But the basic idea is, is that a bodhisattva is really, really operating from a deep place of non-duality. Really deep place of non-duality. And so the idea is, is that to vilify the hell realms and to praise heavenly abodes, that is dualistic in that way. And so the bodhisattva is doesn't vilify the hell realms, but also doesn't praise the godly realms. The bodhisattva understands that they are just different in that sense. That is sort of the equanimous approach that the bodhisattva would have to those. But of course, what makes a bodhisattva a bodhisattva is that great compassion. So when a bodhisattva hears about beings in the hell realms, the bodhisattva has great compassion for beings in the hell realms, great compassion for beings in all the realms in that way. Now, the one thing that I didn't mention last week, and I kind of saved it, it's sort of about where the bodhisattva stands in relationship to those five paths of rebirth. What I want you to kind of notice is, is the Bodhisattva hears about the woes of those in hell and those of even in the human realm and has compassion for all five paths of rebirth. But interestingly, the Bodhisattva seems to stand somewhat outside of those five realms. And indeed, that is why they are a Bodhisattva a being of awakening, 
And I often like to remind everybody uh, kind of this idea, bodhisattva. Bodhi means awakening, right? It's the root of buddha, bodhi, right? Awakening. That word sattva, sattva means a creature, a being. And in Sanskrit, what you will find are there are water sattvas, you know, fish. There are air sattvas, you know, birds and stuff. There are land sattvas, there are these kinds of sattvas, those kinds of sattvas, and there are bodhi sattvas. So my point is, is that humans and animals are made of flesh. Bodhisattvas are made of awakening. And so in that sense, they do not abide in the animal realm or the human realm. They can take on the form of an animal or a human or any form actually is one of the uh, perks of being a bodhisattva or at least an upper level bodhisattva is the upaya of the transformation of form. But the point is that I wanted to mention is that, again, the bodhisattva is not necessarily in any of the five rebirths. Now we can kind of start to get to the next five qualities. They are all sort of related. And I, need, I want to tell you before I read it, I need to tell you just a couple things about it. So... The way to think about this, ah, uh, yeah, I'm gonna I'm gonna mention one more thing really, really quickly. So a really, really helpful way to think about what I'm about to read is thinking about it as, and everybody knows me, and I love to use the dream analogy. So I want to use a dream analogy really quickly to put us in the right frame of mind of how to think about this. So the idea here is, is that let's say, you know, pick, pick your worst five humans on earth, right? That, that you would definitely not want to be anywhere near. You wouldn't want to have a conversation with or anything like that, right? You take your worst five. And I want you to pretend that you fall asleep, all of a sudden you find yourself in a dream, but you think it's just another day in your life. And then you encounter those five people. <laughs> now, the idea here is, is that if you think it's just another day in your life, you will probably, you would probably respond to those people the way that you would respond to them, quote, in reality, where if they made you angry or they made you whatever, when you see them in a dream, you'd get angry, let's say. So I'm just going to use that as the particular emotion here, the idea of the, uh, getting all angry. So the idea is, is that the Hinayana, the original Buddhist path, would and does teach us and train us how to control that anger. We work on it and we train at it and we are compassionate and we are lovingly kind. And then I get really good at that. Like I'm practice, I'm well practiced, and now I, I, I don't get angry. Om Shanti Shanti Shanti. So now... I go to sleep, I get into this dream world, I still think it's just another day in my life, but when I see those five people, I'm super kashanti, I'm super patient and peaceful. It's those five people, or at least I think it's those five people, but I'm not angry. I've cleared out that defilement or that affliction. That would be the arahat path. That would be the Hinayana version where one has controlled their anger. And even in the face 
of the five worst people, I don't get angry. Now, I often use the, the phenomena of a lucid dream. I use that state of a lucid dream as an analogy for Bodhi, for awakening. The idea being that in a dream, we are deluded, we're confused, we think it's reality, and therefore, objects are turning us around. Things are getting to us because we're confused. We don't know it's a dream. But when, if you've ever had a lucid dream, when you become lucid and you become aware that you are in a dream, your disposition towards everything changes radically because you know, oh, I'm down there sleeping. This isn't real. Holy moly. <laughs> so that is akin to awakening. That is akin to Bodhi, the awareness of the dreamlike nature of what's happening in that way. So at that point, the Bodhisattva has a, in the dream with the five people, the Bodhisattva has a great realization. The great realization is those five people are their own most intimate self because they're, you're dreaming them because the Bodhisattva is dreaming of these people. They're not real, they're dream characters. So you know what that means? When the Bodhi or when somebody has a dream and meets those five people, and then they're just getting angry, the Bodhisattva realizes, I'm just getting angry at myself. Literally, I am literally just getting angry at myself because in normal objective reality, we get angry because we want the people to know. We want them to change their behavior. We want them to apologize. We want, you know, we're trying to affect change with our anger. And when the Bodhisattva realizes that those five people are just a figment of their imagination, they understand that if there is anger, it is only anger at themselves. So at that point, the Bodhisattva has a choice. The Bodhisattva is very much like an arhat, where they are not getting angry at those five people because they know it's dream, they know they're dream people. So the Bodhisattva is now Kshanti, is chill towards these five people, but the Bodhisattva now has an extra move to make. The extra move is that the Bodhisattva can actually give loving kindness and compassion to those five people. And in doing that, they are filling their dream with love and compassion rather than anger. And the point is, is that that is the Bodhisattva's choice. They can get angry and be in a world of, eight, of anger and hatred, or they can generate loving kindness and compassion and be in a world of loving kindness and compassion. The choice is sort of all up to you in a way. Are you being turned around by objects and they're making you angry? Or would you rather turn objects around in that sense? So with that in mind, that that, that radical shift in the mindset, not only is it unwise to get angry at other people, ultimately I'm just getting angry at myself and I could make this really radical move of extending loving kindness to others and purify my Buddha land, is the idea. Okay, so with that being said, here is the sixth 
quality of a bodhisattva. So a bodhisattva, in addition to having compassion for all beings in the five realms, they also think to themselves, in my Buddha field, there will be no lower realms of rebirth. Upon the mere thought, there will be an abundance of food and drink and clothing for everyone. In my Buddha field, beings' lifespans will be limitless. In my Buddha field, there will be no sense of clinging and personal possession. And in my Buddha land, all beings will be certain to attain unsurpassed perfect awakening. Until I purify my Buddha field to that degree, I will not relax my virya, my determination. Shariputra, if bodhisattvas have those 10 qualities, their aspirations will not degenerate and they will purify their Buddha field. Okay, so that introduces, oh, awesome, I have a perfect amount of time. So that introduces this, the, you could call it the Bodhisattva vow, but the Bodhisattva vow is the specific vow to awaken all sentient beings. So that's the vow. But this way of thinking, and I, and I wanted you to notice that the Bodhisattva thinks to themselves, Right In my Buddha field, there won't be these hell realms and ghostly realms. In my Buddha field, food, clothing, and drink will appear at will. Actually, in the Chinese, it's about food, drink, and clothing appearing as, one, as all beings wish it in that way. So this is a mindset that the Bodhisattva is practicing this sort of vowing or willing or wishing that when I become a Buddha, I'm not going to rest until my Buddha field is so pure that all beings have everything they need. And then the other things as well. So I just want to mention really quickly, because I actually also want to read the next paragraph. It's kind of really uh, important to this Dharma talk. But I just wanted to mention about that mindset. You do, or you could imagine, you could imagine somebody having the mindset of like, wouldn't it be great if the whole world were dependent upon some product that I produced? <laughs> right? Wouldn't that be great if I were wealthy because everybody else was dependent on the products I produced? You could imagine somebody might have that mindset, right? But what I want you to be thinking about is if you had that mindset, like of dominance, the mindset of, of, you know, whatever it is. I just want you to kind of be thinking about how that mindset of wouldn't it be great if that was the case could eventually lead somebody to starting a company and creating a product and pushing it to the point where, yeah, I don't know, maybe they're Nestle and they control water or something like that. And somebody being very happy about the fact that they control all the water. Contrast that mentality to the mentality of wishing that everybody has everything they want at will. What I'm getting at is, is that I know that the Pure Land stuff can sound a little, I don't know, maybe call it utopian. It's been called utopian before, so that's fine. But what I want you to understand about it is, is that it might not be about actually, although it might though, but what I was getting at is it might not be about actually 
having everybody be able to manifest food at will, but the changing of one's mindset to wish that were the case for everybody. And again, my, my feeling is, is that everybody here listening to this is probably thinking, doesn't everybody want everybody to be happy? Doesn't everybody want that? Because I know I do. Well, that's why you're in a Dharma class is <laughs> probably because you would too would like to see all sentient beings satisfied in that way. The idea again is that not everybody's on the same page about that. But the idea is, is that it's a mentality that the Bodhisattva cultivates through making vows like this. Everybody feeling good about that? Cool. So let me read this next part, because again, it's kind of really important to the flow of this. Additionally, or furthermore, Shariputra, such bodhisattvas as these, if they approach a tathagata, a buddha, or the stupa, the memorial, of a Buddha or a Tathagata carrying flowers and with this wish saying, may my Buddha field that I obtain upon awakening be filled with myriad flowers as sweet smelling, colorful, beautiful, pleasing and gorgeous as these. May it be adorned with trees of myriad precious substances. And the same would apply whether the Bodhisattva were to offer powders, perfumes, incenses, garlands, ointments, clothing, food, drink, parasols, banners, flags, gold, silver, lapis lazuli, pearl, conch, crystals, or coral by dedicating or transferring all of that to the purpose of manifesting the arrays of virtues of a Buddha field, and by abiding by the vows of discipline, such disciplined bodhisattvas will accomplish all their aspirations. Additionally, Shariputra, Bodhisattvas who never utter displeasing words to anyone, but only utter pleasing words, will not hear displeasing words spoken by any being in their Buddha field. When they attain awakening, they will only hear pleasing sounds. Shariputra, additionally, upon awakening, a bodhisattva who does not seek their own happiness, but instead seeks the delight in others' joy, all the beings in their Buddha field will be satisfied with sublime happiness. Shariputra, additionally, when awakening is attained by bodhisattvas who have unceasingly practiced and accomplished those 10 aforementioned virtues and have dedicated or transferred those roots of goodness to or for the sake of omniscience or for the sake of omniscience of perfecting the arrays of virtues of their Buddha fields, all the beings in their Buddha fields will follow the path of the 10 virtues and become endowed with insight into dependent origination. Okay, I'm gonna pause there. So that of course went on, still talking about the Buddha field of this uh, Bodhisattva. A very important term got mentioned there twice. It was the term either dedicate, or I translated it also as transfer. So in the first paragraph, it mentioned that the Bodhisattva by dedicating or transferring all of those things, the, all of the things that they made offerings to the Buddha, 
by dedicating all of those to the purpose of manifesting the arrays of virtues of a Buddha field, and by abiding by the vows of discipline, such bodhisattvas will accomplish their aspirations. So the word that's being called dedicate or transfer, it's a term called pari namana, P-A-R-I-N-A-M-A-N-A, namana, pari namana. It means to like transform, literally to transform. It be, is known as transference, and you probably know it as the transference of merit, a very, very kind of integral part to Mahayana and Vajrayana Buddhism is Parinamana, the transference of merit. So if, you've, if you're familiar with the transference of merit, you might know it as looking like this. I do a ritual or I do a sit, classic one in Buddhism. I do a 30 minute sit. And then at the end of the 30 minute sit, I do a transference of merit that basically says, whatever merit was gained from this meditation practice, may it go to the benefit of all sentient beings. And that's a transference of merit. That is a very classic one. Again, it's done throughout the Buddhist world. Whenever basically anything good is done, not only do we do the good thing, but then we take all the merit, bundle it up, and transfer it for the benefit of all sentient beings. So that's parinamana. And the idea here is, is you, yes, it's, it's, you know, it's become a very ritualized process where you know, you do the thing and then you transfer it to the benefit of all beings. And, you know, it's a great practice, absolutely. But I want to give you a little deeper insight into like, like what's going on with that. So the basic idea of a parinamana is, or this is one way to think about it. There's a lot going on with it. But the, the reason why I'm really interested in this parinamana thing is the Buddhists, the Buddhists seem to be very aware of transactional thinking and the pitfalls of transactional thinking. This idea that, like, if I did something for you, I should get something in return. And if I'm not going to get it from you, then I should get it from the universe in the form of punya, in the form of merit. Now, what I want to mention is I know that not everybody in maybe in the audience moves within a framework of punya, of merit. You might not think in terms of merit. It's a very Indian uh, it's a very Indian way of thinking. Even the Chinese were not super in originally into like merit as such, but the Indians very much. If you're not into merit though, you can think about it like this. You can think of it as like, you know, maybe it's like your neighbor's moving and they need help carrying a big couch. And the idea is, is you could say, wow, they're having a hard time moving that couch all by themselves. So you go running over there and you lend a helping hand to do. Now, in, in, in an Indian system, you'd get, a, you'd get punya for that. You would get merit for such a kind, selfless act like that. And if you accrued enough good merit, that could do a lot for you in terms of a rebirth or in terms of enlightenment, lots of things. But again, if you're not thinking in terms of merit, I just want you to think about the idea that I did this nice thing and then you walk away feeling good about yourself. And I don't want to discourage people from doing nice things. I don't want to discourage people from feeling good. But 
there is a way that a bodhisattva would look at that feeling of a good thing I did. And there's a certain way in which the bodhisattva sees that as a pat on their own back. And a bodhisattva who is really attuned and acutely aware of the way all of this is happening, by which I mean dependent origination, they're very aware of how that very feeling is going to be reinforcing the delusion of a self. Because isn't it then I did such a nice thing? Aren't I such a nice guy? And then the next move, and what about that guy next door that didn't help at all? That jerk. <laughs> He's not a good guy like I am. Now, the, I, I see you, Brennan, one second. But the idea here is, is that there is a bodhisattva technique for overcoming such transactional ways of thinking. And the technique for doing that is, whatever good this has gotten, may it benefit all sentient beings. And that is the transference of merit. And I guess what I want you, or what I'm saying, is I want you to notice how it, it kind of doesn't matter if the transference doesn't reach these other beings in that way, because it's working because you've done it in that sense. Brendan, I saw you, what's up? Did you, were you just stretching, yeah, Brendan? No I, no, no, I was trying to uh, butt in and, and say shit, but I, that last part, I don't know if I'm completely following, but, but I, yeah, I was just wanting to sort of make sure I'm hearing you right, but I think whatever. Yeah, I, I don't know if it has to do with self as much as it has to do with like, good deeds being transactional is horseshit. That's not fucking good. I mean, if what you're trying to do is get something in return, then no. I mean, I mean, I would appreciate it if I'm lifting up a heavy fucking couch either way. And, you know, that's not, that's not how, how it doesn't feel good to do things in that way you know, from the point of view of the do-gooder, like, you know, that, that just, you know, it's just, it feels like a trap. It, it, it fucks you up, but, but maybe that has also to do with self, but I'm, I guess, yeah, I don't totally understand the <laughs> merit thing in relation to like transactional thinking about, you know, good deeds or, or doing the right thing or something, but, but maybe, maybe I just am not there tonight. So anyways, thanks. Um, real quick, Brendan. So you 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 pointed out there is the version of like I'm only going to help you move your couch if I'm getting something in return. So there's definitely that version, which is like that's like way over there. I'm talking about, or I was talking about, no, like a genuine selflessness, a genuine sense of compassion for this person trying to move the thing, and you and you actually responding selflessly, but then walking away feeling like you did a good thing. And again, I know that this is very, it's very delicate because we don't want to discourage nice, good behavior. And there's a way in which we don't want to discourage feeling good about helping people. It's just analyzing that feeling of this little feeling that I did, that I did it. That's, and Brendan, that's why I made it about the self. It's this yeah. feeling of I did something. No, that, and that's, I think, I mean, it's completely the Buddha land. Cause it, the reason to do it is because you want to live in a world where people don't fucking just walk by people that are struggling with heavy shit. I mean, you know, I don't want to live in that world. And, and as part of, trying to live in the world where people will get out of the way when I'm carrying heavy shit down the sidewalk. <laughs> you know, I try not to be angry about it, to understand that like people are fucking not paying attention all the time and it's not about me. And I don't want to also live in the world where I get to be resentful of people for doing stuff that is just obliviousness and not about me and my heavy shit and all my back problems but um <laughs> anyways yeah so so but it is very much yeah the buddha lands of like i you know i can't you know arrest all of the suffering but i can yeah the intention is certainly 
Yeah, I don't know. This is, yeah. You, th anyways, <laughs> go ahead. Continue, Anoy. please. Thank yeah, you. Noe, Noe. Oh, hey there. <clears throat> Thank you. <clears throat> Excuse me. Uh, it was something you said earlier when you finished the first five parts and you discussed about, I, I, I'm probably not going to get it right, but it was something like arriving at or creating, uh, you know, a place, a state. Yeah. And, and for me, it, it's become an idea. That state always exists. I didn't create it. It's <clears throat> becoming mindful of the state enough to let go and go stillness. I don't create stillness. It's always there. It's always been there. And in turn, when I find, when I practice, and that practice is enlightenment, it's not separate. Enlightenment is practice. Practice is enlightenment. For to that, that yes, my world is affected, but not a single piece of dust has been moved. Mm -hmm. Nothing has happened. And, and yet I, I, and yet, so it's not creating something. It's about, it's a, about a, perhaps arriving. That's what I wanted to say. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I think, <clears throat> excuse me, I think the, the, kind of the Buddhist way of what of thinking is about these obstructions or these nivarana, the coverings. It's just removing the coverings. Like they say, always say in Buddhism, the sun's shining. It's the clouds that might be covering, but it's shining that way. Um, and by the way, really quickly, just a response again to Brendan and actually every uh, the couple of comments. That last part that I read about a bodhisattva who never utters displeasing words to anyone, but only utters pleasing words, will not hear displeasing words spoken by any being in their Buddha field. So, Brendan, your conversation, you're mentioning going down the street or walking down the street made me think of that. And this idea that, you know, I mentioned this when um, many, 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 many Sundays ago. But I mentioned the idea of like living in, in, in an apartment building. And every time you go in and out of your apartment, every time you go in and out of the building, you're just mean mugging. You just got this stink face. And the idea is, is that people are going to respond to your stink face and probably give you the stink face. Now imagine walking out of your apartment, walking out of your apartment building, beaming, giving everybody loving kindness, giving everybody happiness. The idea is, is that you could transform the Buddha land of your apartment building. And the idea is it could go one way or the other, but you're gonna manifest the reality in terms of your facial expression in that way. And that's a lot of the pure land technology is recognizing that our realities are dynamically being co-created in that way. So I think I'll just leave it at that, at uh, that note, unless there's any last minute questions, comments, answers, or ideas. Beautiful. Then that's gonna be it for tonight. Thank awesome. You. Thank you. Thank, thanks so much. That was that was awesome. Oh yay! Good. Um, you're helping us purify our Buddha fields. <laughs> yay. <laughs> um, so, uh, Michael, do you have any um, announcements you want to make? Um, just really quickly, yeah. Uh, next month, I'm going to start a eight week course on the Vajra Sutra, otherwise known as the Diamond Sutra. Um, that's going to start on July 9th and go to August 29th, I think it is. Uh, but you can go to lotusunderground.com and it's right there on the homepage and you can find out more about that. Um, but if you're interested in emptiness or the Vajra Sutra, it's a great class for that. So but that's it for me. Thanks, Tanya. <laughs>